There is an unknown land with a natural beauty unsurpassed on Earth. It's a rich land and a demanding one. It's people woven from the threads of all the human race. These people expect heroic things from themselves and others. And they've made their country the most powerful in human history. But much of who they are, where they live, what they dream is untold. America, how can we get to know you? Satellite made covering the nation possible and the possibility of creating a fourth network, which we've done. Ted Turner is a man who thinks, talks, and acts in superlatives. A cable television pioneer, he brings to the medium a fresh vision, television with a human face. What we wanted to do was, was go out and, and look for the country that, uh, that I and most of us are, are familiar with, where neighbors help each other out and, uh, and uh, people do their work and are proud of it and are members of their community. The real America needed to uh, be presented. We're rolling. They're ready. I'm rolling. Hey, marker. It would be called Portrait of America. And what Ted Turner envisioned was nothing less than television's most ambitious documentary series, covering every state and territory in 60 hour-long episodes. It would take five years, $20 million, and the energy and talent of some of the country's finest filmmakers. For many of these filmmakers, the making of Portrait of America has been an adventure, an experience of discovery, a quest. Through their lenses, they are discovering an America that few of us have ever seen. this thunderstorm sort of way off in the distance and we were very tired because we had been shooting all day it was the end of the day and I just stopped the car set up the camera put on a wide-angle lens and it was covered the eyepiece and just sat there with the button wondering should I hit the button now I mean when is it gonna flash <laughs> anyway I'd hit the button and it would roll and roll and roll and roll I turn it off, and then of course it'd be a bolt of lightning, <laughs> right? And this went on several times, and then finally it rolled and it rolled and it rolled, and I watched and I watched and I watched, and if it didn't do it, it was smack. It went off, and I was as proud as a peacock. It was a wonderful feeling. Bottles, dishes, coffee pots. In Maine, producer Fish David line. Grubin set out to find their well-known dry they sense of humor. Nothing goes to waste in Maine. Tourists buy it. Lord, they buy everything, anything. Worst-looking things you ever saw. The yard sales are all over Maine. Yes. And uh, we, f we knew we were going to film at one, but we didn't choose it in advance. You just we went shopping at a few, and then, you know, uh, as we were filming, we'd stop off and do some shopping. And there were these fabulous folks and we just rolled the camera and one one command she paid uh, $25 for a bowl lately yeah today Jesus Charlie that's worth more of it well it's over a hundred years old so there's a lot of stuff in there over a hundred years old quilts and well and they dishes want it quite good good well a lot of them don't I don't like understand it. it myself anyway I don't understand it the kind of humor that you get in from Mainers isn't the kind that you can expect to suddenly happen in front of your camera. Hand painted, see, that's what they want. We've gone out 192 times for Saturday nights. <laughs> I I'm glad you counted them. <laughs> I have, keep a record. I have a, I have a diary of every time we've seen each other and talked and everything. I'm glad I'm marrying a farmer. Our experience in Iowa along those lines was that they were suffering the image of, of a hick state, hick farmers and so on, hayseeds and so on. And uh, so they were very anxious to set that straight. 
But I think that they respected what we were doing because they could see we, we cared about them totally. <laughs> and once you approach people on that level, I mean, they're really open and they really want to share it with you. Ah, Eugene Rupert, take you Susan Henderson. Hi, Eugene Rupert, take you Susan Henderson. To be my wife. To be my wife. America, three and a half million square miles. 200 million people. An epic nation, yes, but one that has never truly been understood in epic terms. Instead, understanding seems to lie somewhere in those storm clouds of Idaho, along a main country road, in a chapel in Iowa. Then on the bottom of page three, it takes months of research before the central concept of each Portrait of America episode can be hammered out in script sessions. Here, writers, researchers, and producers will try to solve things on paper before the difficult weeks of filming ahead. From the beginning, series producers Ira Miskin and Marty Killeen wanted something more than a travel log. They wanted to capture on film the essence of each state. You cannot do a good job on these unless you fall in love with the state, you know, unless you respond to what it is its strengths are. If you walk in there and say, this place is garbage, you'll never do. Your film will be that reflection. You have to feel, you have to feel, if not a love, at least a respect. A poem has only so many words to describe an experience so much larger than itself. A film has only so many images. To describe the essence of a state, what visuals must be shown? Whose stories must be told? Producer Bill Jersey is a veteran documentary filmmaker. With camera in hand, he approaches the mountains of Utah. That's got a nice sense of a storm coming up. One of the hard parts about making films about a state is a state is geography. A state is hills and mountains and valleys and rocks and rivers. A state isn't people. So when you begin to start trying to personify a state in terms of a person, you're always limiting a state. You're always making the state smaller than what it is. But I guess the one thing that we felt about this state was it seemed to be that this state was created by pioneers, by people who took risks, people who came here who made something out of nothing, people who made it because they had a vision. Are you coming with us? Um, so I'm going to ski up. You're going to ski up. You're going to go up on a lift. Above all, a state okay. is its people. And here is the consummate challenge for the documentary filmmaker, to find the people who most embody the character of the state. <laughs> Now this is how this is what I want you. This is how crazy what I want you to do. I want you to hold it like that. Can you do that? No. As we began to talk to Alf, we saw that his story was the story in a way of a pioneer, because he came when this was was the, there was no skiing, there was no ski school, there were no ski slopes. It was just a land that was dry and parched with most of the trees were nothing but stumps because the miners had knocked them down to build their mines. And Alf believed that this was a place that could be a ski resort. He made it possible. You got short arms? Where'd you get those short arms? Norwegian arms. <laughs> we don't believe in being invisible. Some crews say, well, we want to be invisible. We don't believe that. We believe in being participant observers. We feel that if we get involved in the lives of the people we're filming, that we do a better job. Everything you do seems to be the kind of thing one does just be as naturally and easily. And Mainly what you're trying to do is discover what's fun for them, what's exciting for them, what matters to them, and begin there. And then you get to what you maybe want to do or what's important to you. Does our insurance cover this, Rob? I hope so. You're making decisions every microsecond. I mean, lights change, uh, which lens to put on, which camera, uh, trying to anticipate what people are going to do because films, other than stills, stills, you know, is, the, is, that, is that decisive moment, just getting that moment when the thing happens. Whereas in film, you always have to roll the camera before it happens. So much of good filmmaking is insight, intuition, a good eye, and a passion for the subject. It also okay. helps to have a crazy sort of determination. That's all we get for our nickel? 
For even with the clearest of intentions, in documentary filmmaking, anything is possible. As producer Phil Burton discovered in South Dakota. whole schedule was really geared initially around the branding, which is a once a year, one time thing with this marvelous family, the Wiesars, and uh, they got rained out. Then the next day we were intending to go to a rodeo with their children, and that rodeo was rained out, so we found a, a rodeo that uh, was crazy enough to carry on and, and had to swim in mud, as you know, for uh, 10 odd hours up to the hip. Uh, it's just an ordinary thing. I mean, you have a little weather problem, it doesn't stop you. We, we have to figure out a story and understand a story and then figure out how to bring all our tools into, into the fray. So uh, there are a lot of technical problems, there are access problems uh, that add to the reporting problems. It's all fun. It's fun to try to figure out. And uh, what we ended up with was an interesting scene of how people survive uh, no matter what. And the, and the, rodeo, uh, the rodeo was carried on even though there was three feet deep of mud everywhere. My, my experience uh, with, with Portrait of America has been has been um, invigorating, really, because I, I I get to see people that I wouldn't see in, or, in ordinary kinds of productions, uh, sort of average people across the country, and uh, they've been marvelous people. They've been talented people. They've been have a great sense of humor. You know, they, as in the case of these people in South Dakota, I mean, nothing stops them. For all the Portrait of America filmmakers, their efforts have brought the same reward, a rediscovery of the American people. Hard working. A strong belief in tradition, but perhaps just as important, our sense of humor remains intact. You gotta be a little careful when you come into the uh, main country store. Like, for instance, now these boys come in here two, three hours ago just looking for a quart of milk, and they've been here ever since. Uh, I think the most memorable uh, day of my life was not being elected president. It was when they turned the electric lights on in my house when I was 14 years old. And artists have to be a little crazy. And the South is a good place to be a little crazy. Not, not too much crazy or you don't work at all. Remember that bank I used to cry all the way to? <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> when I was a young fellow, I believe this is the truth. Uh, if you carried a canteen on your saddle horn, you were a sissy. It depends uh, what part of Missouri you came from. I call it Missouri. Our governor calls it Missouri. It's Missouri, of course. Missouri. <laughs> Missouri. <laughs> well, it, it's spelled the way it's spelled and everything. It's Missouri. Casey, damn it, turn around here. Hey, you see it. If the essence of a state is shaped by her people, her people are shaped by the land. A portrait of a state would be incomplete without giving the viewer a sense of its landscape. The documentary filmmaker paints this landscape with light. For Bob Elstrom and Lucy Hilmer, the land itself is a character of many moods and smoldering potential. We're both in love with light, so we schedule everything from about, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning till, till, till dusk. I mean, we have a very romantic way of looking at yeah. things. We spent a great deal of time seeing a vista that we wanted to do, but noticing the light was wrong, and returning it to that area maybe two or three times until the light was just right, and then taking sort of a portrait of, of a physical, of a mountain, a lake or a cloud or something like that going by. I'm trying very much to uh, to present not just not just the people, but also the land that you live in. My day invariably begins an hour before sunrise. It's just the way it does, and we've gotten used to it. Midday, we try to do our traveling, or if we have interiors, 
do them, and then be out again for the last light of the day. And uh, it makes for a long day, but it's just, it's just when we feel best and, and we want to be happy, when the light is just straight on top, it, it makes things rather bland. And, and, and we want the shows to be as exciting and, and dramatic as, as a camera can, can interpret it. Instead of going out and say, as the old photographers did in the last century, to capture sort of the, the facade of a town, a lot of people standing and posing, you try to go out in a documentary and capture a mood or a feeling or a sense or some sort of intuitive thing that goes on. And we had that sort of take place. We, in the Louisiana show, we went out with a, a crawfisherman. And he took us out to his sort of hunting lodge, way out into the swamps. If he had left us, we never would have been able to get back. This whole kind of very abstract thing started unfolding in front of us. So what we did is we forgot about the original intention of shooting light and all of that. And we started filming the dogs and the relationship of the dogs to the people. And these dogs just followed the boat. And the dogs were always coming upon some animal on what little ground there was. And so what we ended up doing is sort of making a little portrait of craw fishermen. But basically it was a relationship between them and their dogs, and the dogs and the animal and the terrain. And it, and it became more metaphorical. So rather than having a document of how you go about catching these little crawfish, we ended up getting something different. We ended up sort of luckily capturing sort of the atmosphere of what a bayou is like. Bayou and desert, mountain and prairie, suburb and city, the colors and textures of America. The lines, now jagged, now curved, now straight as a cornstalk. The stillness, the turbulence. Could a landscape so varied produce a people uniform, monotone? It couldn't. It doesn't. After over a year of research, writing, shooting, and editing, a Portrait of America episode emerges from ideas and possibilities into a tentative reality. It is now time to make final changes in the film. That task, in part, goes to Turner Broadcasting Executive Vice President Robert Wessler. If changes are to be made, the decisions most likely will be made in this room. Uh, how's the, is the audio okay? They have to EQ it because the mics are catching all that muffling. If the film is approved, it will pass to this man. The most, yeah. The most. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Hal Holbrook is known to millions through his stage, television, and film performances. Let's do a whole run through with microphones. It is his narration that brings the film to life. Camera rolling. Mark. H.L. Mencken, the sage of Baltimore. Holbrook 
what excites me about him is his own intuitive excitement for America and Americans. It contains within it nearly every topic. I mean, having done Mark Twain all of those years, he is so curious about America, and he likes to accumulate new knowledge of America. And, then he uses and that's what makes him so exciting when he delivers it. Perhaps we're just beginning to understand the wisdom of the old Yankee who said, I ain't again the world going modern. I'm just waiting a spell to see where she's going to end up. Almost without exception, every uh, state, the film, you know, that I see before I narrate, I see the whole, the rough cut of the film, not a rough cut, but pretty completed cut. And, and out of the film, when you're finished, there, there's one word left sitting in your mind, you know, one word. And uh, the interesting thing that came out of, uh, uh, of New Jersey, when I finished looking at the film, all I could think of was pride. On this 48-acre pastoral island, George Cume's productivity is astonishing. On one half acre, he can produce one quarter million radishes. On a single acre, 15,000 quarts of strawberries. And in one particularly good year, George harvested 42,000 pounds of tomatoes, all on an acre and one half. I swing between total despair and then feeling that uh, maybe we're going to make it, you know. It depends on what day it is and who I'm, what I'm observing, you know. Some days I just feel this is hopeless. And then in, in another day I'll see something really wonderful happen or somebody perform some really uh, intelligent, courageous feat, either mental emotional or physical, it'll make me uh, feel that uh, we're going to make it. Broadcasters have, like everybody, I mean, not just broadcasters, we all have responsibility to the youth of the country. If they're taught basic, basic uh, positive values of helping out, of neighborliness, of, of kindness, of friendship, uh, of, of dedication to their to their work, or then they'll be much better, much better citizens when they grow up, and we'll we'll have a uh, a better society. I think a great deal of what's on Ted's mind has to do with the exporting of the true American image. That if the rest of the world understands us and understands who the Americans are, as opposed to the caricature of America that is perceived there'll be a great deal less tension in the world, we will become a great deal less frightening. It's been a good experience for me to, to I mean, it makes you proud. And, uh, and uh, without being patriotic in a sort of corny way, it makes you feel, it makes you feel it's a pretty wonderful place. And I'm glad I'm participating in a, in a project that's able to, that's able to, you know, characterize this country. We don't feel obliged to make a Disney picture. What we feel free to is to make a picture about people we like being with and enjoy being with, rather than having to, as network television generally pushes us into, find out who the bad guys are. And all of a sudden, for once in my life, somebody says, hey, go out get some ideas, meet some people you like, and do something about, this is pretty okay, this state. And I think that's really great. So I'm not embarrassed to say, this is not a survey, this is not a report, this is not an analysis. This is a portrait. It's a portrait of a place we like and of people we like. And I like doing that. Years old, and he says, been getting on in years like I am. I can't get around as good as I could. And he says, I just don't think I could have took another one of them main winters. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go. Okay, I'll have, I'll have that's great. That's great. <laughs>